Okay, we're live on YouTube as well. Good morning, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Misha and I work with Early Bird, which is an initiative uh, with the Nature Conservation Foundation to bring people like you uh, closer to birds. And we do this in various ways. We create a lot of content on birds. We create uh, educational materials like pocket guides, flashcards, games, activities, etc. We also do training. We train educators to become bird educators. And we also do direct outreach. We do workshops with kids, we do bird walks, and we conduct webinars like these. So today's webinar is the second in the series uh, that we are conducting with experts to um, help uh, bird enthusiasts know more about birds. And today we have with us Ramit. Hi, Ramit. Uh, who's going to talk to us about bird sounds and bird vocalizations. So before we start, a little bit about Ramit. Uh, Ramit has a keen interest in the natural history of India, particularly in birds, frogs, and snakes. He has authored the first and second editions of A Birder's Handbook to Manipal and has co-authored Mandu Kavani, an acoustic guide to the frogs and toads of the Western Ghats. He believes strongly in the power and potential of citizen, uh, citizen engagement in scientific conservation. And currently he's based in Tasmania and conducts bird watching tours and works with an ecological consultancy firm. Thank you so much, Ramit, uh, for joining us today and taking time out to talk to people about birds and bird songs. Quickly, uh, before we start, I would like to tell everybody that uh, we've put everybody on mute and we've also shut everybody's videos just to avoid a bit of chaos. Um, but the chat box is open and at any point, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box. We have some dedicated time towards the end of the session uh, uh, to, for Ramit to take your questions. And uh, the limit of this meeting is uh, 100 participants, but we know that a lot of people uh, have registered. So if at any point you or your friends cannot join, please share this um, YouTube live link with them. We are also live on YouTube. Let me quickly share the link in the chat box. So if you know anybody who cannot join on, uh, in the Zoom meeting, they can watch us live on YouTube. So over to you, Ramit. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Misha. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, and good morning. <laughs> it's, it's afternoon here in Tasmania, but uh, I might be a bit more tired <laughs> than I'd like to be. I'll just, sorry, I'll just get started with sharing the screen first. Sound. Is the screen visible now? Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. One. Sweet. Um. Okay. I. I guess all of you are bird watchers. I call myself a bird watcher. I suppose all of you call bird watchers. And whether we know it or not, I always think of us as also bird listeners. Um, and bird watching is very intrinsically linked with, with listening to birds because more often than not, you hear birds before you actually see them. Um, you know, we we all go out early in the morning to places where we want to see birds or just at home and the dawn chorus or the number of bird sounds um, is the first thing that strikes us or if you go to a new place like for me at least i i judge um, a birdiness of or how birdy a place is by by figuring out how many birds are calling around me and if there's nothing calling a part of me just you know for example sinks 
and thinks how oh, there's hardly any birds around or if there's so many birds calling you know there's a bit of joy and you look forward to sort of going around and finding more birds um we also listen to birds for um like you know we focus so much on things like the colors and 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 the shapes and sizes of birds and so much so much about what bird watching is focuses on the visual aspect of it but but also we we listen to birds all the time for other things like um you know when when birds you often hear lapwings um calling an alarm and you look up all the time to see if there's or if ducks you can hear like the the flurry of wings around you to see if a bunch of things have started flushing and you look up to to look for a raptor if there's um there's all sorts of you know like if there's a flock of birds coming um stuff like that like you're just constantly listening out your ears are almost as much at work as your eyes are when you're out birding and um and of course we there's things like we name our birds after the sounds they make um onomatopoeia um so things like coyotes are called coyotes obviously because they have the coyote sound there's cuckoos there's common hawk cuckoo which is like a brain fever um you know the kaua in hindi or titar which all sounds they all sound like the sound they make the names refer to the sounds they make um similarly there's birds like warblers which warble or babblers which babble um whistling ducks laughing thrushes so this inherently there's a lot of whether we are uh, sort of always cognizant of it or not uh, there's a lot of sound already intrinsically linked to how we bird how we name our birds and how the very experience of of bird watching right um sorry and of course bird sounds are probably one of the most vital components of identifying birds um one anecdotal well actually it's a general survey conducted in the us it suggests that up to experienced birders um may detect and identify almost 5 to 10 times more species by ear than they do with their eyes so the idea that you may go out bird watching and you have a bird list of let's say 50 species it's quite likely that you only saw 10 birds but you may have heard the other 40 and wouldn't have bothered seeing them for example um but and and as of course with experience you start hearing more and more and you're more likely to you know go to a spot and within 2 minutes you can have let's say a bird list that comprises of 15 to 20 species um but you may have not seen any bird yet this is just you getting out of the car or going out for a walk and you're able to incorporate that knowledge of identifying bird sounds um by ear or birding by ear as opposed to using always seeing birds when you're out bird watching okay. um we also um transcribe bird sounds so one way to remember bird sounds for example is to um we we try and transcribe bird sounds into our languages in this case i've given a few examples of for example this is a red vented bulbul which is it says be 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 careful or the did he do it did he did he do it of the red water lapwing um there's the very if you are the one more bottle or kafil pako uh one more bottle i think water bottle kafil pako different variations of it of the indian cuckoo and so on and so forth so we are always constantly trying in various ways of of sort of learning bird sounds also and using them for identifying birds not sure what's that um but also i think i just always like to remind people how bird sounds are so much more than an identification tool um i derive a lot of joy from bird sounds 
again i have already mentioned for, because of the other things that they they do for me like um they tell me what birds are doing um with time you can tell for example if 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 a cuckoo for example is calling you know it's it's spring or summer um you can you can tell if a bird is singing for example that is probably out on a perch visible somewhere or unmoving likely to be sticking to one spot if you can you can hear warblers communicate marking their territories every winter when they come um to the subcontinent um there are certain birds that always make an alarm call when there's threats around whether it's other people other birds other an animal or whatever it is um bird sounds are also you know we often talk about how birds are a window into nature um which is i always find it interesting because we we think of windows as this visual medium that you look out of a window when you see nature but but window is often the reason like you know we we get a lot of sounds coming into our indoor habitats whether you're at work or at home uh, through those windows and and listening to to bird sounds is a great way of connecting with with nature is a great way of sort of you know keeping an ear out and and being and being present outside of whatever walls you are present within um and to me bird sounds are one of the best ways of just reminding myself that that um you know we we as human beings aren't the only ones um who are communicating or uh, speaking or you know just just being artists uh, birds are are a reminder on bird song in particular of course because bird song and we'll touch upon these aspects within the presentation um is a fantastic reminder of how how artistry is not limited to human beings um and it's something birds are always uh, you know are, are indulging in with the with the creative ways and the the fact that they learn and they mimic and they create their own songs and then they present them to us in saying all of that however um um for this particular webinar within the within the scope of this webinar uh, we'll be using um we'll be focusing on on sounds and and representing them in their visual form and largely with the idea that it aids um identification or helps us to id birds also although i will present i'll do a short quick run through of other things um the visual form can be used for um the tool we'll use to visualize these sounds is something called a spectrogram which is essentially as you can tell here um can you see my cursor i'm not sure if that's visible yes yes i can yeah. that tiny black dot yep yeah. that's it yeah um so these these lines so basically a spectrogram um at its core uh turns sound into an image um and so you can see these lines the three lines for example these are some insects that are calling this is a bird this is a tu 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 kind of sound and we'll come to how we can interpret those later there's a bit of noise in the bottom probably from a car or a nearby street and and so we'll be looking at how we can visualize sounds and sort of make sense of what's called a spectrogram and and this gives an insight into sounds in a way that you know just those fleeting moments when we hear something often can't so to be able to capture it as an image um allows us to delve into those sounds in a in a way that that is so much that well is more meaningful very often or or, or is often so much more helpful and insightful than just listening to something um at the core of a spectrogram is the is the idea that there's three dimensions to a spectrogram um there is so there is basically the y axis oh hang on maybe i can draw this actually so there is the um the time and duration which is along the x axis there we go so that gives you the time and duration um there is the frequency or the pitch and, and so that's the y axis along here and i can't draw it um but the third dimension is the loudness of the song which is the z axis but the z axis is very easily visible in this 2d image which is how how dark 
uh, or well, in this case, so I, I should mention this beforehand, yeah, because I will get this wrong at some point in the presentation. Um, I am colorblind, but basically how yellow, I think the darkness here is the yellow. So that is the loudest part of this song, for example. I think this is a purple sunbird song. And so you can say, you can see it occupies several, uh, like there's several frequencies that you can hear it at. That's the time, the, the X axis, and it's loudest at these frequencies over here. And then, so that's a tick, 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 tweet, 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 tweet. And so in the, in the bottom here, it's loudest here, it's loudest here in this section middle part, and initially it's loudest in the middle too. Um, there's actually a fantastic tool called this Chrome Experiments. It has a spectrogram and you can literally draw something or say something. For example, I can say something and it generates a live spectrogram. So it's a great way of seeing how things work in a spectrogram. Um, but you can also draw, so you can also, and we'll use this, I'll use this multiple times um, on the presentation. It's a great little tool. I suggest you actually have a play with it at some point later after the webinar. It's awesome. Um, and also the idea of frequency in, in a spectrogram. So uh, maybe I'll open a random file here. So this image here um so the frequency oh no sorry there you go so that's the purple sunbird song exactly so you can see these are the this is the frequency in the kilohertz thing so the frequency um i'll just expand on that a bit because it's an odd concept no um it's very abstract uh, so frequency essentially is but scientifically is the number of waves passing through a period of time I'll, I'll explain it through here, but, but frequency in, in terms of listening is basically uh, the pitch. So higher frequency is what we call, it's a high pitch sound or a low pitch sound is actually just a low frequency. Uh, so an owl, and I'll, I can show you. So if I do a ooh, oh, sorry. So frequency in this case, so let's say this is the unit of time is the number of waves in that unit of time, right? So if I do a woo, you can see there's only like three waves. So that's a low frequency. And that's something like how an owl or a dove would call. And if I do a, you can see that's a high frequency and there's lots of waves within this particular period of time. And so that's how actually most birds would use a high frequency, low frequency travels wider so actually if you hear a low frequency sound so if you hear for example something if you on a spectrogram the loudest section is in the low frequency part where was it there we go so low frequency so lower on the y-axis it's more likely to be a dove or an owl for example or if you, if you hear like a high frequency so like thrushes make these contact calls which are very high frequency and so you will see the darkest sections of their calls are often in the high frequency um, regions Anyway, just to, just to give you an idea of what, so I say pitch, I use pitch here. I think normally most field guides and most general, in general parlance, we use low pitch, high pitched, but it actually correlates very well to the general definition of frequency. Um, the reason, uh, you don't have to look at this slide, it's too complex, too many words, but basically the reason I, I really love spectrograms is it's, it's really intuitive. It's incredibly intuitive how these sounds come about. And it's just very, very easy to learn how to make sounds um, or how to read a spectrogram, but it can totally revolutionize how you actually experience birding. Like it, it when I first discovered spectrograms, it just changed, it just changed how I viewed or well, how I listened to birds and also how I viewed bird sound um, as an experience, right? Like you can just, it just adds so much more to the overall birding experience. And by intuitive, I, I'll actually come back to that later, but I'll just hint upon it now. Um, so if you think about how would you draw a bird sound? So um, for example, if I was to draw this, um, that if I was to ask you as a layman, like, what does this sound like? 
what does a line that goes like this sound like? Like to me, intuitively, it sounds like a wee or like a sad whoo. It's like a sound going down or like a sad, like a sound that's just like a straight line is often just a ee. And, and that translates very beautifully into how these sounds actually sound. Um, so like a happier, sad, or a completely flat whistle. Um, and so in, in that way, like visualizing sounds very, very intuitive. It's very easy to get into. There's no, there's no, um, it really isn't rocket science. Um, if you are into your field guides, field guides also use things like uh, multiple notes repetitively, you know, like um, a series of tweet, tweet, tweet notes repeated multiple times. Or if you have something like the Birds of South Asia by Pam Rasmussen and stuff, it will actually mention uh, a series of notes separated by one to two seconds um, or high pitched, high pitched trills um, or a nasal sound repeated every so often in series or as a trill or a metallic sound and they'll use all of these things in a field guide and the the good thing is that all the aspects of those, those terms translate really well um, into visualizing sounds into so it's very easy to sort of compare like if you're able to visualize a sound you can easily make notes about it and compare it with the with an existing description of the sound in a field guide and it just, you know, when you pick up a field guide and you're just starting out birding, for example, um, like in my case, I used to just look at the images and at the illustrations. As you get more experience, you start reading the text that comes alongside the illustrations. But the sound part, very often you just ignore because you don't know what to make of it, comparing it to a sound you just heard. And, and being able to visualize those sounds or being able to record and see the visualization and compare it to those descriptions, um, makes a field guide also much more valuable, like the experience of working with a field guide. Um, and lastly, I'll just touch upon this quickly, spectrograms, because they're essentially a recording and a, and a visual representation of that recording. They're able to just capture sounds that otherwise my ears wouldn't listen to. Um, so for example, I'll just pick this recording. This is a purple sunbird again. You can hear jungle babblers, a red vented bulbul, a rotating parakeet, there's a squirrel, and all of these things. So when I'm actually just looking at the purple sunbird, I'm not focusing on those seven or eight different things that are calling in the background, but I can take a recording, go back home and look at all the seven or eight different things that are actually calling there. Um, or as we'll discuss later, there's, of course, now you can just use an app and you actually get to see all of your um, you, you get to see a live spectrogram and you can see everything that's calling. And so very often, especially in loud environments like built up urban areas or where there's like a train or a plane flying over you, my, my for example, my ears can't, can't uh, hear past a loud truck that's driving past. But when you're recording those, those little squiggles and lines depicting the sound of other birds that are calling still show up. And so you can always um, look at a spectrogram to see what all was actually calling. Um, this is, of course, um, something scientists also use often and anybody can use really is to create soundscapes. You can just make a recording of the general um, environment around you basically. And, and you can look at a soundscape, much similar to a landscape as in just you know, sounds around you and see what all is there, even though you may not be able to visualize those things or for that matter, um, sort of see, see the birds that are there. Um, there's essentially, so we've already discussed this. So basically there's five building blocks to every sound. Um, you can even break it down to three building blocks and everything else is a sort of, is a culmination of using three things, which is monotone, uh, rising sounds, falling sounds. So that's like a basic pee, twee, two, like a happy twee, two, an overslur, which is coil. Actually, coil is like an overslur. So you go up and then you go down, and an underslur, which is like a two you. Uh, so all bird sounds essentially are a combination of these five in one way or the other. Um, there is one exception, and I will build on that. Um, I'll also share 
this so this is on instagram i found this video by i think it's melophilus and which gives an idea of of how complex this gets but this is a this is a lovely little instagram reel that um incorporates that falling rising thing for a great tit and then it goes on to a european robin which has a much more complex song so have a listen But that's essentially a, a, a spectrogram right there, incorporating all of the previous elements uh, from the slide before, and uh, just showing how simple songs can be and how complex songs can be. A really nice little video. Sorry. Um, so yeah, monotone notes, uh, for example, just something like that. And as you can expect, it's just represented by a single line. You can actually see the wavering elements of that call, which you know otherwise our ears cannot decipher very easily. Um, rising notes, for example, this is a magpie robin, the sweet sound. Um, and then this is a tailor bird with its falling notes. And just a variation of the same rising and falling, when the line becomes like a vertical line, it becomes a click. So kind of like this flap echo coil, for example. So as you could hear in that one, the, the click um, is pretty obvious. So, um, so that's just an exception sort of but it's, it's really actually if a click is a rising note that's become vertical. Um, also in general, when we, I guess I, I'll just mention it here. Um, when we talk about musicality, uh, the more flat a, a note, um, the more musical it sounds to the human ear. So if it's actually, I could show it here. So the more it is like this, um, the more musical it is as a note. And oh, oh sorry. Um, the the if it sounds like a click, um, like if the more vertical it is, the it's the more unmusical a note is, so to say. Right, and the same elements then um, become so. Uh, you'll often see these. I picked these words: so series, trills, phrases, and warbles, because they are the ones most often used in our field guides and descriptions of bird songs and bird sounds. But essentially, a series is you see a note, and that note repeated again and again, but with a time gap in the middle, and it's a very abstract idea, but a time gap is essentially just, um, if you can count individual notes, it's a series. And if you cannot count the individual notes, it becomes a trill. Similarly, if it's a more musical song, if you can count individual notes, it's called a phrase. So you will often see a cluster of phrases delivered X and Y by an X and Y bird, or or a warble, a, a sweet melodic warble in spring, and so on and so forth. But and in in a field guide, what they're referring to is basically a cluster of these these notes that are given so quickly that it sounds like a warble. So I'll give you examples of that. Um, so a series, for example, is this. So this is a black nape monarch. And you can hear the individual sweet, 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 sweet. So these are rising notes delivered quickly. But you can still count individual notes. Compare that to this, I think this is a gray crested tit. 
that technically you can't really count it by year. And so that would be a trill. So it's a series of those clicks. And when delivered so fast, it just sounds like a single note, but it's actually like a trill, right? Uh, similarly, you have um, something like a phrase. There's this. So it's, you can see this individual. So there's a falling note, an over slur, falling note combined with an over slur, rising note, and so on and so forth. But delivered at a pace that you can actually tell what they are. Um, compared to this, this is a vertical flycatcher. It's given so fast that you can't actually, just by ear, decipher um, individual notes for each other. So just the technical terms, basically, series, trill, phrase, and wobble. Uh, very useful if you're writing eBird notes, if you can't record a call, um, if you or if you're trying to put down a, a call, a, sort of like a drawing of a spectrogram on, into your notes. Um, sometimes uh, if you hear it and you can't actually tell apart multiple notes for which is falling, what is rising, um, it's quite likely a wobble. So a description of and being like a wobbling sound uh, would do. Um, and then there's the qualities of, a, of, of uh, the sounds, right? So there's things like, um, that we use whistles, hoots, clicks. I've just made a little note. Bubbling, burry, as in like a wavy sound, harsh and noisy sound, nasal sounds and polyphonic sounds. So I'll come across to all of these. So whistle and hoot, I really wouldn't touch upon. A hoot is basically just a low frequency whistle. And a whistle is just a regular whistle. So actually if... Um, so just a... I'm a bad whistler, as you can tell, but just a straight sound is what it produces. And a hoot is just a, as you can tell, there's a, this is the red section. So I'll just tell you what to look out for, sorry. Uh, so in this spectrogram, there will be a red in the low frequency region. When I say hoot, uh, and that would actually translate to an owl-like sound. So something like this, hoot, hoot. So you can see the red over here. And if I whistle in my poor whistling <laughs> form, uh, you'll see the red come a bit higher up. So something like a... So you can see the red in the middle of this section here. And so if you, on a spectrogram, if you're seeing that the strength, the loudness, um, as we discussed of a sound is in the lower frequency region, that's a hoot. If it's higher than that, usually it sounds like a whistle. Then there's clicks, which you already spoke about. So clicking sound is basically like a vertical line on the spectrogram. Um, then there's nasal sounds. So that's a Brahmini kite. And those three notes, actually the notes over here, and you can see as the kite gets more nasal, it gets more and more overlapping layers. So you can see, I think this is playing by itself at the moment. Um, so in a nasal sound, how you can tell a sound is nasal is basically when there's harmonics. So harmonics in a spectrogram, essentially is these same sounds layered on top of each other. And the more the number of layers, the more nasal the sound. So you can tell it gets more and more nasal, this guy. And to give a very practical demonstration, um, so for example, if I say something like a A, and then I do a A, you can actually tell how it gets more nasal when I do the nasal sound as humans do it. So that's an easy one. Um, there's harsh notes. So shrieks and scratches. So if you're familiar with something like a like a like a blight street wobbler, for example, um, they do these harsh notes as well as crows, of course. So crows make these harsh notes when I can again give an example of this Sykes wobbler. That's a trill. Oh. Sorry. Uh, 
maybe this booted wobbler yeah so you can see those so a harsh note is actually when you look very closely into it um it's actually a, a very nasal note but with many 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 layers and it becomes just a fuzzy form of sorts and it produces um uh, what is essentially what we would call a harsh note so to give another example i'll actually pick a house crow sorry we took up this ready apologies for that there we go um so i'll pick a random recording let's say this one oh this is awesome so actually you can tell so this is a nasal call by a bike or a scooter so the horn is obviously producing a nasal sound and hence the many layers and with the crow you can tell that this is actually really really fuzzy it's multiple layers just layered on top of each other um and so it's it's so nasal that it actually becomes this fuzzy blurry thing and hence you get that harsh quality of a crow like sound right um and then there's wavy sounds so this is one of my favorite kind of sounds this is a jerdan's uh, night jar so that ooh kind of call and it produces this very distinct wavy spectrogram um that can they're so distinctive like in the night if you just record something and you're in south india or actually north india well near the himalayas or something for example uh last tail night jar does something similar and you get these in the background you get these recordings with uh, the wavy calls and actually another good example is uh, for example the barbets white cheek barbet and brown throated or sorry brown headed barbets lineated barbets their calls often have the kutruk the ruk part comes out as a wavy part um and that's also very similar to this to give an example again so white cheek barbet for example when it calls clear off the code so you can actually uh unfortunately i don't think i can tell very clearly in this recording but it that that quality of the sound of the kutruk uh quality is actually something that's there um in these spectrograms true uh another example for example would be something like a eurasian blackbird call or i'll give you a better example sorry so this is a thrush i'm familiar with from from australia and they often have this call so you can tell this is a very high pitched call and the normal normally the human ear will listen to it like the 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 call you will hear is like a seep but there's a very uh, wavy element to it and so it it's it's always amazes me how you know like if you're in the field and you're in a forest and you listen to this call all you hear is like a seep and then you look at a actual spectrogram and you're able to make out these finer details and and there's so much complexity in that call that that thrush makes that you completely miss otherwise with the human ear and it was something similar for me with the jerdan's night jar where it sounds like a very simple call but there's it's such a nice complex wavy pattern where the waves actually get smaller with time and you can see there's there's like three or four waves and the the call the call itself doesn't sound nearly uh, it sounds much more simple than the pattern actually um, shows um and then there's something like a buzzy sound so similar to a crow let's say but with a distinct emphasis on certain points so this is a savanna night jar so 
so you can tell how it's like a crow in that it's it's got that harshness to it but you can tell from the the loudness of it that the the harshness is concentrated at one point compared to a lot of points and so it sounds more like a buzz as opposed to like a harsh scratchy sound of a crow um and then some of the most amazing calls that birds make um are like these polyphonic sounds so this is a really bad diagram i'm sure somebody can do a better job um but so um to give an example right like in in humans this is very similar so there's two lungs you your your sound comes out to a trachea and the voice membrane is somewhere here and so we have essentially one voice box through which the sound carries right but in a bird as you can see here the voice membrane there is actually two of them and so they are able to make these sounds how do i say two sounds at the same time essentially overlap overlaying on each other or sometimes not necessarily overlaying but one one lung is working on producing one sound and the other lung is working on producing another sound and so you have a very similar structure to humans but but instead they have two voice membranes and going through a voice box called a syrinx as opposed to a larynx in humans it's a very simplistic explanation okay and it it helps them produce these really complex polyphonic sounds polyphonic similar to let's say the ringtone you used to get in those older phones where you know suddenly you instead of a t t t t you get you would get two sounds overlapping each other and um to give an example um, i'll go back this is a magpie robin So you can see, so it's producing all of these primary sounds probably from one lung, and then it's making all of these secondary sounds. You can see on top the high pitch sounds, the these downward uh, falling notes up here with the other lung. So it's quite possible that it's actually using both. I mean, it is actually using both uh, lungs to make two different sounds. I'll give you an example here. So it's pretty cool how birds can do that, and it's it's probably one of the most complex forms of sounds they make. Uh, one example you come across all the time, in a, on a more global basis, is something called a wood thrush. Ooh, sorry, not sure why that was so loud. So that's a it's a bird called a wood thrush. that's a bird called a wood thrush and it produces two very distinct set yeah, that's better um so you can see the main one lung produces this and then the other lung produces a song on top so you've got two lungs working in conjunction to produce two separate sounds this thrush is in india that do that too so for example i think the nilgiri thrush does it scaly thrush does it. Very similar. Um, so those those are essentially at the very basic level between between um, these blocks, how these blocks are structured to form series, trills, and phrases and warbles, and then how um, depending on how messy. they are on a spectrogram that will tell you the tone so falling sounds in a series of falling sounds as a trill or uh, a melodic warble or a metallic warble or a whistling warble all of those things essentially these three these three criteria can encompass what field guides or um, iding guides or as a birding uh, enthusiast will pretty much cover most of the aspects of what bird sounds are um there's also a lot of more fun stuff that you can get out of 
looking at spectrograms. So I'll just quickly again just touch upon uh, a few things. So there's one thing called plasticity, which is how plastic a song is versus, versus how stereotyped a song is. So to give an example of what a plastic song is versus how stereotyped a song is, so, uh, well, to give you a description of what, what they are first. So plastic sound is basically a song that is often given by juvenile birds or in some cases, adult birds. Uh, I had an example open somewhere here. Yeah. So yellow-throated sparrow is a good example or just a shouldered petronia where it sounds to our ears. Actually, a house sparrow is a great example. So a house sparrow does chirping, right? So if you had to describe the sound, it would be a chirp. But they have a very interesting song in that each note tends to be different to the previous note compared to a stereotyped song in which every note, uh, or sorry, every phrase or a note is, is different. So to give an example, So this is a plasticity of the sound. So you will notice in this chestnut shoulder petronia, it's actually doing different things with every single note. Every single note is different. This is a song of an adult. And so it, it blows my mind and like, because it, it sounds all the same to my ear, but when you look at a spectrogram, you notice how complex, like how, um, how much it's actually varying every single note. So there's like a wavy element to this note. There's a slightly blurry, blurry element to this note. There's rising tones, there's falling tones. Um, compare that to, let's say something like an Indian pitta, which is a more stereotyped sound. Every phrase is more or less exactly the same. So you'll notice every single phrase of its song looks identical to the previous phrase compared to um, a chest and shoulder petronia. Um, in some cases, in some bird species, the plasticity decreases as the bird becomes an adult. So juveniles or first year birds will often have a lot of plasticity in their song. And so not only can you tell apart which species it is. So if you're seeing, for example, if, if you're hearing something that sounds like a chest and shoulder petronia and on a spectrogram, every single note looks the same, it's quite possible it's not the yellow-throated sparrow um, or chest and shoulder petronia, it's something else, right? Um, or if you think you're listening to an Indian pitta, but every single phrase looks different to the previous phrase, it's either not a pitta or it could be a juvenile pitta. So a lot of juvenile birds or first year birds that are just practicing will often display a lot of plasticity in their song. So they'll see that it's varying a bit um, and because they haven't refined their song to make a final song for that particular season or for, uh, for their remaining adulthood. Um, there's research to say that some, some adult birds never learn once they've reached adulthood. So song, Oh, it's a full other topic, but I'll just briefly touch on it. So essentially song in many birds is learned and they practice this song. And so there's a lot of plasticity initially, and then eventually they develop the final song. Some birds like the Oriental magpie robin, for example, I think is retains some element of the plasticity and is able to adapt that song multiple times over the course of its adulthood. But in some cases, it's seen some adults lose the ability to learn more once they become adults. Um, so there's plasticity, there's dialects. Um, this is an example of an ashy prinia, and it's, so it's got that you know, typical jimmy, 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 or chispy, chispy, chispy kind of song. And it's, this is that song, but the spectrogram shows how complex each different song is. So this is different individuals from different parts of India. And it's quite possible that all of them show some form of local dialect, um, that may vary across different regions. Similarly, with Pridyas, um, it's quite interesting to see if you record them often. Um, it's one of my favorite things to do when I'm in India. They Even within individuals, you can see that different individuals will show different um, song types. And so the spectrogram shows these differences amongst various individuals. 
and then there's repertoires. So within a single species, I'll give you an example of a, of a graving blackbird from Almora. So this one's like obviously a particularly amazing individual, right? So you can see it's got, so these are phrases. I'll just combine all that we have learned so far. So different phrases of different types of notes, overslurs, wavy notes with multiple overslurs and underslurs. There's rising notes, uh, there's falling notes, there's nasal notes. And every single phrase, because you can actually count like you can hear every note individually, every single phrase that's a cluster of these notes is different to the previous phrase that it's sung. And so that's just remarkable. So that accounts for its repertoire. So very often you can classify species with multiple, with like a repertoire of sounds versus another without. And they may or may not exhibit themselves in like one after the other, like this black like this graving blackbird, but in some cases they may obviously exhibit themselves over a period of time, like in a racket tail trongo, which has a repertoire of the songs it mimics, um, or just the sounds it makes over over time with a single individual. Um, so just to give you an idea of the of, of terminology you'll hear, um, and amongst the variations that these sounds often have. Uh Ramit, just quickly letting you know that it's 11.50 and we need to take some questions also. Yeah. So it would be great if you can. Yeah. So this, uh, yeah. So I'll just wrap up now. I'll just quickly, um, if you have any of these apps, I think this last one's for only Apple phones. I'm not sure. But Song Meter Touch and Merlin are fantastic resources for you to look at spectrograms of different songs, but also they allow you to record sounds um and see live spectrograms so if you're interested in the field uh to look at spectrograms of what you're listening to um that's one resource there's um Macaulay library and Zeno canto are two websites i highly highly recommend for sort of comparing bird sounds and uploading bird sounds that you may record and i've i've wanted to touch upon tools but actually that's probably a separate webinar altogether. And my, my recommendation to anybody who asks me, how do you go about recording bird calls? I, I always say like, you have probably the most um, straightforward recorder in your hand all the time. So your phone is like a fantastic tool. And, and nowadays phones are so good and their microphones are so good that you can make amazing recordings. The fact that you can, um, you know, like this is on Merlin and you can just go and, go and record, oh, sorry, you can go on sound ID and you can see like a live spectrogram as I speak um, and you can just record a bird and just save it over there. And it's just a fantastic little tool. So things like that, I just recommend to start off with if you're new to bird recording or bird sound recording, just use your phone, use one of these apps that I've mentioned earlier and just go out there and record. Uh, but yeah, I'm happy you take questions now. Thank you, Ramit. That was very, very, very insightful. And we're open to questions now. So if anyone has any questions for Ramit about bird sounds and what he's spoken about, please type them in the chat box. Ramit, uh, can you open the chat box? Or can you see the chat box? Uh, okay, but I can read it out to you also. No, no, uh, I should so... be able to see it. It shouldn't be hard, right? Hang on. Yeah, got it. <laughs> So we can start with uh, Nishant's question and then Navya has raised their hand. So perhaps we can uh, go to Navya next. Yeah. So uh, Nishant is asking how to distinguish between different wobbler calls with spectrograms. Right. Okay. Um, we've got, okay. Yeah. Um, actually, I had an example, just kind of lost track of time. So I'll give you an example of, of two very similar looking species. Look, I mean, songs in isolation, just like anything in isolation with identification is probably not diagnostic. Um, 
So there will be an elements of what you're seeing, where you're seeing it, how you're seeing it, what it's do, but what a bird is doing. All of that has to be incorporated. But for example, to give you a, a, a species pair that can be difficult to, add, to separate from each other can be something like a booted warbler and a Sykes warbler. Um, to our ears, oh, sorry, hang on. To our ears, their calls can sound very similar. But so I should. I just realized. Sorry about that. I am not sharing my screen anymore. <laughs> I just quickly do that. My bad. Um, so this is. Can you see Google Chrome? Yeah. Okay. Even uh, actually, I okay. Yeah. So that's the booted wobbler. Which can sound very similar to us. Oh, sorry, my bad. So you can sound very similar to a Sykes wobbler, but when you actually look at the spectrogram of a booted wobbler versus a Sykes wobbler, you can tell the differences straight away. So a Sykes wobbler has a more thinner tick compared to a booted wobbler, which has a more fuzzier, a longer time period, only in milliseconds. Of course, but enough to distinguish by eye, even though you can't distinguish by it by ear all the time. So you just have to sort of, it's just a matter of doing it again and again. And you will start noticing these differences between multiple different birds, where blithe reed wobblers, for example, sound different to clamorous reed wobbler, clamorous reed wobbler to thick built wobbler. And all of them have like a, a nuance that is much more easy to capture on a spectrogram than, than probably listening to them. Although I find that once I see it on a spectrogram and I keep an ear out for them, I can actually use that knowledge in the field and you keep getting better at identifying things in the field as well. That's one way to do it, yeah. Thanks, Ramit. So Vihan has raised their hand. I'm asking Vihan to unmute. Yeah. Vihan? Do you have a question? Yes. So first, I wanted to ask, what is your favorite bird? My favorite bird? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I keep changing every day. Um, <laughs> but but maybe maybe something like a magpie robin or something quite nice. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, all right. All right. And i also had a question about the sounds so why is it that higher frequencies can't be heard by human ears and uh, and i also had a question about the sirens uh, that i'll ask later but yeah how do we not pick up the sounds properly um so, so i'm no expert in the matter but I, essentially my understanding is that if that birds have a different hearing range to humans or different species of birds may have a different hearing range to humans. But I think studies actually show that we hear very similar things, um, except for some species. So humans can hear somewhere between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz, so 20 kilohertz, right? Um, and birds actually, most of the song seems to be within the same frequency range. Although above 10 kilohertz, humans really seem to struggle. Um, similarly, for some people, depending on how the ears are tuned in to things, above six, uh, six kilohertz or five kilohertz can be a bit of a struggle. So things like um, Jordan's bushlarks, for example, tend to sing only above that range and they, they can be missed by human ears, but two, several humans can hear them and several humans can't. Um, but yeah, you're right in the sense that some birds only communicate above what is comfortably audible to human ears. But I think my understanding overall is that birds and humans actually seem to operate within a very similar frequency range. I hope that helps. Thank you. Thanks, Vehan. Um, the next question is by Chinu, who's asking how to recognize which bird by sound? If both bird sound is the same, um, it's it's a similar principle to how to recognize birds if they have the same colors or the same size and structure. It 
it's bird identification in itself like bird identification bird sounds have to be used as one of the factors that aid identification but cannot in itself be the only basis for iding birds so actually one of the examples i give um, for this is a green sandpiper and a changeable hawk eagle so if i just play the call of a green sandpiper to you uh, hang on yeah, so when you share screen this time ramit uh, do um, make sure to share sound as well oh which i did in last time is it hang on i think yeah 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 uh share screen share sound yeah okay i think something like this um when you listen to that and a changeable hawk eagle has a surprisingly similar spectrogram and a call but of course just like an idea just a sort of it's a very broad example but how sim very different birds in vastly different habitats can make very similar calls and, and so call alone can't be used of course as an identification factor you have to use it amongst um you know you have to use it in conjunction with all the other things that you're seeing about a bird so what it looks like where it is um i think in most cases habitats calls and behavior if you can't see the bird and but you see it flying you got an assumption of like where it might be is it inside a forest is it flying high low in a wetland all of those things can sort of come about and, and play a large role in the id of a bird um can you play the call again uh, the bird call didn't play uh, it didn't the chat oh. box that they couldn't hear the okay thank you audio i did so share screen share sound okay let's try again hmm. um so this is the crested hawk eagle and i can actually play one of these calls here so that's a green sandpiper right not exactly the best example in this time earlier the earlier example was better but you get the idea of how the the sonograms can be somewhat similar the call is also uh, actually this one there you go so those are the two calls so they can sound very they can, they can look very similar they can sound fairly similar but of obviously they're very very different species thank great yeah so i'm going to take some questions from youtube now since we're also live on youtube yeah uh, so vik is asking i came across this situation a few times more in the northeast i see and record a bird call then come home and it doesn't match at all with any of the spectra uh, spectrograms on ebird or birds of the world the guide does confidently tell that it is the call of the species the question i have is can we limit ourselves uh, with the calls that are available on merlin or ebird um well i mean the short answer is is no and and you shouldn't there's multiple reasons for that a is um, birds are i think i think one of the policies of of something like a field guide or an online app or something is 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 birds just like in a field guide birds are so much more complex in their plumages and with aging and sexing and molts and all those things you know that you can't rely on one single photograph or one single illustration of a bird calls or something similar that a single call may only be a representation of what might be a vast repertoire um of bird calls that the bird may actually be able to make um and the other thing is that we know very little because it's i think the ability mobile phones have essentially changed the way we view understanding bird calls because all of us are able to record bird calls now and and so our um understanding of how 
vast the repertoire is 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 only growing and it's still very uh, sort of it's in a very nascent stages especially for regions like the northeast where you know the the birds are still not very well understood especially when it comes to their vocalizations alone so if you are certain of what you saw i highly recommend submitting it online to one of these forums like xenocanto or or, or ebird uh, so it can go up on Macaulay Library. And so that, I think, enriches the understanding of bird calls for all of us. Um, I also recommend if you, um, Merlin and Birds of the World or any other app only captures a snapshot of the various calls a birds can make, I do recommend having to trawl through a bunch of recordings on these platforms um, to maybe get a better match for the call you've recorded. Hope that helps. Yeah. Uh, another very interesting question, both on YouTube as well as in the chat box, is related to mimicry. So Anu is asking, racket tail drongo imitates so many birds. Mostly the bird is visible, but how can we distinguish its imitation from a real bird? Once I heard and saw it imitating a newborn puppy. Yeah. Sometimes you just can't. Um, look, it... Again, in isolation, if you hear, so, you know, you get all of these, uh, that I used to live, so I used to live in Manipal, right? And we had a lot of racket tail drongos around us all the time. The, the trick I used to use was I used to just wait. And, and drongos, you know, there's that video, for example, of a black drongo, I think, mimicking a cat uh, with a meow, meow call. And it, you, you just cannot tell that it's not a cat. And uh, similarly, with racket tail drongos and, and leaf birds, for example, do a very similar thing. They, they mimic um, leaf birds uh, around Manipal, at least, used to mimic shikras all the time. And you couldn't tell it was a shikra if you just heard it once or twice or three times or for however long it's mimicking a shikra. But I find that for birds which are really good at mimicry, especially if you know you are in that kind of region where they're abundant, um, giving it time. Very often, for example, a drongo will do a mimicry and then it will switch to some other bird or it will switch to something that's more typical of that drongo. So with racket tail drongos, to give an example, the one call I used to look look out for was that tito, tito kind of door, doorbell kind of song, the sound, and it would invariably come back to that sound after mimicking whatever it was mimicking. So it, it just takes sort of um, just takes time sometimes, sometimes a bit of experience with what it's trying to mimic and you can pick out abnormalities or vagaries in the, in the mimicry, which, which don't quite add up. Uh, normally the mimicry is more metallic than the actual bird. Sometimes it's not. Um, but yeah, you have to, it, you have to take it with a pinch of salt and, and be the judge yourself over there. But I think generally giving it time to make its own call works most of the time. So. Yeah, um, we've already gone past 12, but since we're getting a lot of interesting questions, maybe I'll extend the session by maybe another 10, 15 minutes. Let's see. Uh, there's another question by Lakshmi and they've raised their hand and I'll just ask them to unmute. Yeah. Um, Lakshmi, I'm requesting you to unmute. Oh, uh, yeah. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Uh, can uh, sexing of the birds be done uh, uh, by uh, sounds? They uh, emit like the, the song differentiate. Yeah. Can be picked up in the spectrogram of a male and a female? That's the first question. And the other second question is, uh, how to dis differentiate between a juvenile learning the new song and a crystallized song. These two uh, questions I had. Yeah. Um, I'll answer the second one first because it's touched upon something that I briefly skimmed over in the presentation. Is to, is to look for elements of plasticity, especially if you're uh, familiar with the adult song. Uh, juvenile songs tend to be quieter, uh, to, tend to have a lot more plasticity. So in the sense that they'll be... So they'll often be at a lower frequency 
or a higher frequency so not quite the right frequency they'll they'll have more plasticity within every single element of the song so they'll keep changing very often and it'll not be as loud as um, a comparable song to an adult um with the second with the first question about sexing birds <laughs> using calls i can speak for certain species and i must admit none of those species are indian species um, it's just something i've i've heard around home and it's something i've become interested in maybe since i moved to australia but my recommendation would actually be if you can it's a great topic to pick up for a lot of indian birds where if you can start recording these species and see if you can see differences in spectrograms um maybe at some point on the line uh, use something like raven or something to see if there's differences in peak frequencies or in patterns at a broader scale um but uh there's no i think there's no direct answer to it it might vary from species to species i don't think enough research has been done in indian birds at least not that i know of uh but someone might know um but at least like you know okay to give an example in australia lyre birds males and females sing but they have different songs so you can actually tell them apart um whether that's true for all some indian birds all indian birds no indian birds i don't know but again uh, i think you're free to uh i would recommend highly tracking down these birds seeing if they're males and or females and then um uh, you know start recording um and see if you can see differences yourself thanks ramit uh one last question i'll take from youtube uh this is by bindu and they're asking do different species of birds sync their sounds for any reason and form a unique bird song uh not that i know of not so the the closest look i mean the a very straightforward answer a very poor answer would be something like no as far as i know but in saying that i think it is an interesting question um and i know somebody who is working on so where i live in tasmania there is at least somebody who a phd student who is working on um on alarm calls amongst this group of birds called honey eaters and they seem to in honey eaters they seem to call let's say a raptor is flying above them they'll they'll call in a particular order between multiple so they form these big mixed species flocks so they have three or four species of honey eaters in one flock and they call in a in a, in a very fixed order and so you hear like one call second call third call um almost as a confirmation that there is a need a raptor or what species of predatory bird might be there so there seems to be some element of birds being very aware of what other species are saying um and that it might actually contribute to the overall knowledge of birds around them to confirm what species is around so i hope that kind of answers there must be something but like i said there's so much so, so little we know as far as these uh, you know what birds are actually saying what they're communicating especially in amongst indian birds that um i i cannot say anything with this much surety in this case yeah. great thank you so much ramit that was very insightful and it really did open a new window into the world of bird sounds for us um for uh, everybody here if you want to listen to any part of the session again or you missed some parts in the beginning or at any point uh the entire recording of this session will be on our youtube channel i have shared the link in the chat box uh do subscribe and also go through all the other videos that uh, uh videos and webinars that we've uploaded thank you uh thank you for joining us today and if you have any questions for us uh, unfortunately right now we have to close the meeting but i am typing our email id in the chat box it's earlybird at the rate ncf-india.org feel free to write to us uh, if you want to get in touch with us or if you have any follow up questions ramit has shared uh, a few links in the chat box for you guys to explore i will make sure to update these links on the youtube recording of this session as well until then um thank you again for joining thank you ramit for taking the time out for talking to us about bird sounds and we'll close it for now thank you thank you, you so much